Hey guys, so uh, we did the Wheeling for Wildlife ride, uh, I already posted it on the web. Um, anyway, so uh, at the end of the present, at the end of the ride, um, the wildlife people came down um, and uh, they were like fantastic and everything. From uh, Red Creek Wildlife Center, specifically Peggy and uh, um, Hannah Bell, as you'll see, um, learn. And uh, anyways, um, You'll see everybody's gathering, and we are going to um, check them out. Um, I did have a point where I ran out of battery, and I had to switch a battery real quick. But uh, um, please, uh, you know, like enjoy the presentation um, from uh, the wildlife uh, conservation uh, people. Perry takes two steps back. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Can we go over? Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to go over there, or do you want to stay here? Well, it's up to you. Whatever you're more comfortable with. Hi, baby. Stretching his wings. That says, I want to be on the next dollar bill pose. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. This is a turkey vulture. Let's go over there. We're fortunate to have them close by. We take them all to animals. We just picked up one the other day that we found that we took there. Uh, turtle with a respiratory issue, but we've taken many animals there. They always welcome all the wildlife with open arms. In areas and things that we do here, we see the wildlife all the time. We're very passionate about saving the wildlife as much as we can. So it's nice having a rehabilitator close by. Red Creek, kind of, I'll let her explain Red Creek, but they are phenomenal with everything they do. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here and for supporting us. My name is Peggy, and I'm the founder of Red Creek Wildlife Center. Red Creek Wildlife Center is a wildlife rehabilitation center. You know what, why don't you move in on the shade? I'll move back. And we take in all species of Pennsylvania wildlife, about 4,000 animals every year. We, <laughs> we make a great ceiling fan. <laughs> um, everything from like hummingbirds to eagles, from tiny little baby squirrels to fawn. We take in turtles, snakes. If it's wildlife in Pennsylvania, we'll accept it. We have four licensed wildlife rehabilitators on staff full time. And then the rest are volunteers and, and interns. We're open every single day of the year, even Christmas. If somebody has an emergency, we're, we're there. Um, every once in a while we get in an animal that cannot be released and it can learn to tolerate not only captivity, but handling. And those animals get jobs. If they can learn to tolerate different uh, environments and crowds and even car rides very few get to be ambassadors they're very special and this is Hannibal uh, Hannibal is a turkey vulture he is 16 years old and we have had him since he is one year old hmm. the reason that he can't be set free is in physical he is completely uh, a perfect healthy turkey vulture and if I would let him go, he would soar into the sky. And then he would approach the first person he met and <laughs> open up their shoelaces and play tug of war with their feet. He spent the first year of his life in a tractor trailer riding around the United States. The person who found him, rather than turning him over to a wildlife rehabilitator, decided it would be cool to keep him as an exotic pet. And these guys eat dead stuff. They're not hunters, they don't kill. But he was not fed dead stuff. He wasn't fed roadkill. He was fed dog food. And when he was a year old, we don't know if he escaped or if the guy got tired of him and let him go or what. But he was flying around being harassed and attacked by other local turkey vultures. He didn't go to vulture charm school. He didn't know how to behave around them. And he was up there flying around looking for dog food. He found it on a woman's back porch in a bowl. He ended up flying in, said, how do you do to the dog? And ended up getting so sick because he was so emaciated and so dehydrated when he ate this dog food. He threw up the dog food and a purple plastic lizard toy Anybody here ever like Barney when you were young? Yeah, I got bad news for you. He ate him. <laughs> so we got called. I went out. I, gave, I showed him a little bit of hamburger. 
He knew what it was, he hopped right on my arm like, yes. Showed him a dog crate, he hopped right in like, let's go. Took him back and rehydrated him, uh, dealt with his starvation. And the only thing we could do with him was turn him into an education animal. Wildlife rehabilitators, one of the ways that we raise money is we do programs for schools, scouting groups, things like that. And we'll take a hawk, an owl, and whoever else is in a good mood that day. And every rehabilitator has a red-tailed hawk. Everyone has a screech owl. A few have great horned owls that are easy to handle. How many of you were here last year? You remember Gabby, the great horned owl? I brought Gabby, our great horned owl, last year. He is now 26, and he's still doing well. He was going to be here today, but I thought you'd like to see something different. Nobody at that time, this is 15 years ago, nobody at that time had a turkey vulture. So we knew we had to give this one a special name because he was going to be a hit. Because he <laughs> loves programs. He loves people. And uh, so we named him Hannibal. And when I would go out and I'd do programs, i end every one of my... Pro I'll take a hawk, I'll take an owl, him, whoever else is in a good mood that day. He ends the program, and the very last thing I would say, and his name is Hannibal, and everybody clap, and it'd be like, yay. And that's how I'd end my program every year. And three years ago, that changed. And he turned 13, he got really sick. He didn't want to eat. That's a big thing. But he didn't want to be handled. He didn't want to go to programs. He got really nasty. We took him to the vet. They really couldn't find anything specifically wrong with him. They ran blood work on him and they gave him an exam. And we started to worry. Their average lifespan is like 20 to 25 years old. He was only 13. We started to worry that eating dog food for the first year of his life had maybe caused some kind of irreparable damage that he wasn't gonna live out his full life expectancy. And then all of a sudden, he, laid an egg. <laughs> He's a girl. We never knew. Then he laid another one and was back to his old self. Well, herself. So we couldn't keep the name Hannibal anymore. So I'd like you to meet Hannah Bell. <laughs> a little bit about turkey vultures. Um, turkey vultures are one of the most misunderstood birds only because of their appearance. A lot of people think that they're ugly. I personally think that they are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but then again, I love bald men, so. <laughs> you know, I don't think the baldness makes them look ugly at all. If I can get her to pose, let me move her out to the sun a second. And you can see the iridescence on her feathers. Oh, wow. See that? When the sun hits their feathers, they're, the colors that come out are just magnificent. And they're hams. <laughs> she will pose. Okay. Say. What happened to the egg? The eggs were never fertile. One of, the, one of the problems with an animal that is a human imprint is they don't get along with others of their own kind. And even though it's cool that we have her and we get to bring her to programs, you get to meet her, and, and that always seems like a really wonderful thing, the sad part about it is this. Vultures are very social animals. Yet, she does not understand that she's a vulture, and other vultures do not like her because of her behavior. So she lives outdoors in a flight cage all by herself all the time. And the only time she really gets any interaction is when we're working with her, we're feeding her, we're taking care of her, or she gets to go to a program. And that's a sad life for an animal that lives to be social, because they are, and they're extremely intelligent. We have to give her toys to play with. A couple misconceptions about these guys is that they're uh, dirty and smelly. They're not. They're one of the cleanest birds that we find, although she has a little bit of white on her chest right now, 
which means she hasn't preened herself, and that is really unusual. Because um, oftentimes she'll stop in the middle of a program just to fix a feather. They're that meticulous about staying clean. And they have to be because what they eat is stuff so rotten that nothing else will touch it anymore. Say a deer dies in a field. The first thing is, if a person comes along quick enough, depending on the weather, they could take it home, get it butchered, call the game commission. Game commission will give you a free permit for 90 days to use the meat. Once it gets to the point where we don't want it anymore, other things will still eat it. Eagles, big eaters of deer. Um, coyote, uh, raccoons, opossums, anything will come and eat it. But then the flies find it, they lay eggs, they hatch into maggots, beetles find it. The, uh, the meat starts to rot, maggots start to take over, and the bacteria that grows in the meat puts toxic gases into the meat. It becomes so toxic that we couldn't even now cook it to make it healthy again. Because although we could kill the germs, we can't get rid of those toxins. And that's about the time it's their turn, once nothing else wants it. But they're built for that. They're the garbage collectors of the bird world. First thing is they have a, a bald head, which helps keep their head clean. So they can take their head and stick it inside a rib cage of something, and there's no feathers to get all slimed up. Do you notice you can see right through his nostrils? Yeah. See that? He doesn't have a septum, but he does have muscle control. He can squeeze his nostrils shut. He can also squeeze his ears shut. And then the maggots can't go crawling up into his head. He's built for what he does. <laughs> his stomach acids are that strong, they will dissolve metal. You're watching that, aren't you? It's up there. <clears throat> when they eat something, it will completely dissolve in the stomach acid, and their digestion is so thorough that when they go to the bathroom, the only thing left is a little bit of whitewash. It's called urohydrosis. They dribble it down their legs. He just did it a minute ago. There's hardly any stool left. And the uric acid is so acidic, it itself kills germs, and they dribble it down their legs. It helps sanitize their feet and cool them off. Go for what they, what they do. What do, you, what do you feed them? What do we feed them? We feed them uh, frozen, thawed mice and rats that are bred. We call them micicles. <laughs> and, we breed our, and we breed our own. So we know exactly the food that they're getting. We don't pick up roadkill for him. Although back in the day before Red Creek could afford to, to uh, raise our own, we used to go on roadkill runs and, and pick up roadkills for the animals. But he likes his food fresh. Does anybody have any questions? How many vultures do you have? How many do we have? We have uh, for education or all at the clinic? At the clinic. At the clinic, well, we have uh, we have a black vulture that's also an education bird. Uh, we have two black vultures that are there right now rehabbing. A uh, turkey vulture that's rehabbing. We just released one. Right now, we have four bald eagles. Do the education um, help um, birds get along with each other? No. No, and the the black vulture is also a human imprint. Someone hand raised that as well. One of the reasons that wildlife rehabilitators exist is because it helps get all the animals into one place so that they can grow up together. If Hannibal had come into us when he was a baby, we had an adult female one-winged turkey vulture at that time that would have raised him. And he could have grown up with a natural mom and been released. We've released a lot of baby vultures over the years and they're never an issue because they're raised together and they're raised with other vultures. We keep a, a selection of, especially raptors, because they can be really dangerous if they're not afraid of people. Uh, we keep a selection of birds of prey that are not releasable just to use as foster parents. Even if they don't like being handled and they don't go to programs, they live there just for the opportunity to raise babies. Um, some of them have a dual purpose. Gabby, our great horned owl, 
will do both and raise seven baby great horns for us this year. He's raised over 120 in the 20, 25 years he's been with us. And he's gone to over a thousand programs. So we have some animals that are dual purpose. You're a little unsteady on there. I'm moving around too much for you, aren't I? 